Hello, magical people of the internet. I am Jen and welcome to my vlog, I Never Thought I Would, where we discuss doing things that we never thought we would do and the fascinating places that they can lead us. I have a phenomenal author to chat with today. She was one of the founding members of the WordBridge Writers Conference and her second novel was listed as one of the Kirkus Best Fiction and Literature Books of 2020. Hello, C.P. Hoff. Hi, how are you, Jennifer? I am wonderful. How are you today? I'm good. The weather's good. It's not snowing anymore, so it's good. I know. It's so nice when we finally get through the winter in Canada. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I think it was a little bit of a surprise. We had flowers blooming and things were, the leaves were green, the cherry trees and apple trees were blooming, and then we got a couple days of snow. That tends to happen. That's why, because this was just the last, this was the long weekend in Canada and they always advise us not to plant anything <laughs> until after the May 2-4 weekend because mm -hmm. there's always a chance of some snow and some frost in May. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you have, you have three books published and you're working on your fourth. And I know from talking to many authors and being an author myself, we have an adventurous imagination and it sometimes leads us to doing things that we never thought we would do. So why don't you share one of those stories with us today? I, I never thought I'd ride a mechanical bull. I, wait I, a second, I need to pause to like let my jaw drop because I'm terrified of doing that. Well, I had a 4-H calf growing up, so I was used to being around cattle, and um, the, you have to quite a bit, you know, when you're 4-H and you have a cow. It, we, I didn't have a cow calf, I had a steer. So I would go every day, take him out of the feedlot and curry him and take care of him and do all the things you have to do. So I was used to that part of it. And when we were really small, my grandmother, they still used, have you, do you know what a stone boat is? I don't. Okay, a stone boat is like a raft that farmers used to put rocks on when they were you know, clearing fields and it's pulled by a horse in the in the winter they put bales on it to bed the cattle so my uncle still used a stone boat when I was a girl so we used to all the time he never did it with a tractor he always did it with um the stone boat and that was up until probably about 1978 so it was wonderful so we were used to you know riding around the stone boat him throwing bales off to the you know to to open up for the cows and if you accidentally fell down beside a calf uh, it you know you have to run back onto that stone boat before the cow got you so I was kind of used to things like that having to stand in a field and um scream to help move cattle I was I was used to doing that but riding a mechanical bull was a bit different because I thought when I got on it that it was really a wild ride but apparently they had just put it on the easiest and I still <laughs> I still felt I had bruises on my legs, like where I held on. I was all bruised inside my, inside my thighs. I was just black and blue from riding this stupid bull. I thought I did an amazing job, but apparently they said I flopped around like a piece of spaghetti. I was all over the place. But okay, yeah, I'm gonna take you back a second. Where did you do this? Like, how did this opportunity come about? I was in, it was in a, a country in Western, it was the country bar. It was, and they had, you know, the, the music playing on one half and on the other half they had a mechanical bowl. And you were there with some friends one night? I was there with a friend of mine. Oh, yeah. And I just decided, it. no one else did it, but I decided, I looked and thought, you know what, I'm going to try. And so I did. And it, it's unusual for me because I tend to be a person that likes to stand back and watch. I'm not the one that gets out there, but um, I think I, I just decided, well, I was curious, so why not? Has it been life changing? I would never do it again. <laughs> but but um, I, I since then I've been um, uh, just last spring I was bucked off a horse and had it, I was hospitalized. So um, oh. just because it was my fault because I was getting on the saddle and I don't know if he spooked or what happened. But every time I tried to put my leg over, I was kneeing him in the um, flank. And he would buck. And so he's bucking and bucking and bucking. And I was um, on my stomach and holding on. And I landed on the horn. 
and it had it the thing that it ruptured was what did it rupture just something little some little gland and it was everything else was fine i ended up in the hospital and they yep you've got this one little little tear so it was fine but it was quite a painful wow i'm so sorry that happened i used well, to cry quite frequently when i was younger and i've been bucked off a couple of times and both times were my fault also <laughs> yeah yeah it was i should have stepped back off instead of holding on you know i should have stepped back but i just was holding off for my dear life thinking he'd stop and i kept kneeing him and he was not going to stop yes but I want to go back to the mechanical bull for a second, because you said that you are the type who usually stands back and watches. Yes. And for some reason that night you were out with some friends, nobody else did it, but you had the inspiration to get on and try. So do you find that that experience kind of switched your mindset a little bit from being somebody who sits back and watches to somebody who gets involved in the action? I, well, you know, I don't drink, so I wasn't drinking. So that wasn't part of the issue, but I think at that time of my life, I was going through a divorce mm. and I wanted to get some of my autonomy back. I wanted to get, do you know what I mean? I wanted to yeah. get some of my, um, the power you wanted to feel powerful. I, and I want to know if I wanted to do some, I could do it. And apparently the thing that struck my fancy was riding the mechanical bull. But yeah, that's- but That uh, makes that's sense cool. that you wanted to take control of your life in a way that, you know, because you felt like other things were falling apart. Mm -hmm. That definitely makes sense. Um, and do you, do you feel like it was helpful? I, I think I did feel a sense of accomplishment. I, until you asked me about it, I had forgotten all about it. You know, we went to, have you ever been to um, Carnival? I have not, no. They have a mechanical it. moose in Carnival. And a couple of years ago, we went, uh, I think it was five years ago now. And um, my daughter, she rode the mechanical moose. And she was only like 13 at the oh, time. Wow. So she's, she's much more adventurous than I am. But yeah, she did. So yeah, maybe it runs in the family. You go from riding mechanical bulls and then your children ride mechanical mooses. But she did a lot better than I did. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how children sometimes have more courage than us as adults. Yeah, she she's something else. Out of all my kids, she just, she just, she amazes me. Yeah, that's so yes. cool. Well, now I'd like to talk about your new book, The Canterbury Tale. I know that it got a Kirkus star, which is very exciting. It did. And I know it's a unique story in terms of it's about a, a seven-year-old protagonist, which is unusual for adult fiction. So yes. why don't you tell us a little bit about the plot of the book? Do you remember the Dion quintuplets when they were born in the 30s in Ontario? They were the first living set of quintuplets born at home. They weren't okay. even in the hospital. And the Ontario government took these five little girls away from their family and put them in Quintland, which was a, 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 a fenced in area. And people came and paid money to watch these little girls sing songs or to ride their bikes. It was quite, it was like a zoo for children. And the Ontario government made a huge amount of money off them. So it, I know you're the most devastating thing and it doesn't make you proud to be a Canadian, does it? How did they have the power to take these children away from their parents? Well, the doctor was called Dr. Defoe and he did, the family was very poor and they were, I think they were French Canadian and I think he used it against them because they were born in Ontario, right? And he just didn't think they would give them the same quality of care he did. He became, he just... He took those girls from their parents and he became Papa Defoe and he acted like he was, uh, and the parents weren't even allowed to have, they didn't have any custody and they had no reason to not have custody, except that they were poor. And because the girls could make the government money. Those were the only reasons they lost custody of their children. Oh my God. So they I were think in this zoo, so to speak, where they, they were, were on display and people could come and pay to watch the spectacle. That, that's right. And they made, they, they, people paid a lot. I think there might be even, two, I think two of the sisters are still alive. 
I think, I don't know if they ever married. I, I, I really don't remember. I read about them, but I haven't for a long time. But anyways, with that in mind, I thought, so you take a small town in Saskatchewan and in the 60s, this happened in the 30s, so it's 30 years later. And this town looks at the Defoe's and thinks, well, they made up bushel full of money off these five little girls. When this little girl is born out of wedlock in the hospital and her parents abandon her and they're kind of ne'er-do-wells, what if they put her in a comic strip and the town made money off a comic strip they wrote about this little girl's life? So that's the basis of the story. It's about a little girl who's abandoned at the hospital and the town that has this comic strip about her, she's being raised by her grandmother and the grandmother has kept the comic books secret from her until she's um, somewhere between grade one and two, a neighbor tells her about it. So then she becomes aware of how her her life and her everything she's done has been exaggerated and kind of paparazzied her little life. But it, it sounds terrible, but it, it is. It is terrible, but it's done with a very um, humorous take. And I know when I say that, you think, well, how can that be? But it, it, it is. Um, you'd have to have a peek and see for yourself. But it is about a little girl and her her comic book strip life. Wow. And then her coming to terms with the fact that, yes, that, that there her, is a comic strip about her. Yes. She calls them her should have been parents that abandoned her. They were her should have been mom and her should have been pa. And the comic strip doesn't even, um, when they, when they, when he, when they, she's drawn, she's drawn with a seasonal head. So when it's Easter, she gets an Easter, she looks like an East, a Fabergé egg. And at Halloween, she looks like a pumpkin. At first day of school, she's got a Dick and, Dick and Jane reader head. So she different, when things happen, she doesn't look like herself. She's a character of the event that's happening instead of even being herself. This is so fascinating and imaginative. I've never heard of a story concocted in such of a way before. How did you, other than knowing the story of the quintuplets, how did you, what process did you go through to come up with this comic strip idea and to come up with, you know, the inner life of this little girl? Well, you always have to do is open almost anything online and you see how the paparazzi have wrecked people's lives and they've intruded on them. If that's not hard to come up with, how people can decide or you even see the cancel culture. Sometimes they've canceled people that it's, it's been hard to watch sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, we're in a very exploitative time right now. Yeah. It's like one false step, one false sentence, one yeah. false move and they become they go viral they become exploited and and you know what the thing is that we forget that all of us are capable of making that false step the the only difference is is we've made false steps in private where we've said something think yeah that wasn't so kind I shouldn't have said that we have bad days you know I've heard someone say never judge a man by his worst day but that's what we seem to want to and with this cancel culture I don't believe in cancel culture, we're all multifaceted. Mm -hmm. Nobody is all good. Nobody is all bad. We all make mistakes, but there's something very unforgiving about the culture we live in right now. Mm -hmm. There's no room for growth. Yeah. And a lot of us make mistakes and then we grow from them. We learn from them. And there's this, that space to learn and grow. And, and we, we seem to think we have to be only one thing. You know, you're, you're, if you're a dam, you, you can't have any beliefs that are outside this box we've given you. And we should have lots of beliefs and they should be in lots of different boxes. And that's good. Well, yes, it's, we're trying to make the world so staunchly black and white when everything is gray. And we've lost sight of the different shades of life right now. And also, in this black and white era, everybody's own truth is being purport purported. We're, we're losing the truth mm -hmm. because everybody has their own truth. Meanwhile, you can have your own truth, but the world is still black and white. And I don't understand how um, these diametrically opposed ideas can live in the same world. It's very... No. It, it is crazy. It is crazy. It's, it's frightening. I feel 
And it must be so confusing for our younger people because you and I are of an age that we can look back and say it wasn't always like this. It, it makes your fair. heart sad that people will give death threats, people they've never met over things that are, you may have found offense to it, but to threaten to hurt somebody or to kill them or maim them, it makes zero sense to me. People are going out looking to be offended and misconstruing people's thoughts, misconstruing people's messages because trying to be combative with people. Anyway, I want to get back to your book. Okay. <laughs> I love this story of exploitation and I love the fact that you place the protagonist at the age of seven years old. It's funny how we have more sympathy to children because they're helpless. They don't make their choices. But how many people have you seen or met that have looked upon a child that's struggling and say, well, look where they came from. Look who their parents were. And they, they, they automatically throw the babies out the bath, you know, with the bath water. They think because you, yeah. they came from this home, there's really not a lot of expectations there. And I think that's how the town views Celia. And I think it's kind of to shed the light on some of the, our attitudes about people that we consider to be lesser than ourselves. Um, Do you know what I mean? That we, we sometimes um, lack grace where we need to have grace. Sometimes we give people grace that don't deserve it, but there are other times, and to find the balance where the grace is needed and where the grace starts, to where so, when you give someone grace, sometimes it give, opens up a door for them to be abusive and to find the balance between giving people grace because it's deserved and being foolish with your grace and giving it to people where they can exploit you. They're, they're very, it's a very fine balance. Well, it's been so insightful and so lovely chatting with you today. I can't wait to get my hands on a copy of this brilliant book, The Canterbury Tale. So please tell us where can we get it and where can we find you? You can find me at cphoff.com. The, the book is at, on Amazon, Kobo, um, Draft Digital. But sometimes, you know, how when you look at a book that has just come out, it's really hard to find. Mm -hmm. If you go to my website, there'll be links to all those places where you can, it's probably a little bit easier. You can try Googling it through, um, through Amazon, but I think you might find it a little bit easier just Great. go to my website and go to the links that are there. And are you on any social media? You know what? I'm on Facebook, but very, not very much. I am of the age where social media scares the bejeebers out of me. And, and you know what? I, you hear, you hear some people say, oh, it's amazing. And people say they're getting off it because it's so dangerous. And I understand. Yes. I, I'm constantly torn. I have like one foot in one foot out at all times. So I, I don't blame you there. Um, but we will have the links below so everybody can find you. And thank you so much, Connie, for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed this. I found it a little bit intimidating. You ask hard questions, my dear. <laughs> You really make somebody think on their feet. You just, I never know what I'm going to ask, but your work is just so fascinating. And my brain just kept going in these directions that I, were unexpected. So thank you. And I'd like to thank all of you out there in the interweb for joining us today. I'd like to challenge you to do something that you never thought you would do. Please let us know what it is in the comments and where it leads you. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a beautiful day.